Welcome everyone. My name is Phoebe Atkinson and I'm the curator of this program and I am standing in today for our host Carolyn Colas who is taking some time off and I'm delighted to be here with our speaker today who I ran into a few months ago in Miami at the World Happiness Summit and I recognized her as a, a fellow um, student when we were back in the day in the early uh, iteration of the Certificate in Positive Psychology. So I'm going to uh, read you a little bit about what she's going to be talking about, Tina, and her bio, and then uh, pass it on uh, to Tina. Uh, her actually title starts with a question which I think is going to set the tone for what she's going to be presenting today. Um, Positive Psychology Hour, happiness, can we synergize our biochemistry and our minds? and Tina Hollis is our um, speaker today. Tina writes, we've all noticed that it's easier for some people to be upbeat and optimistic compared to others. And we know that our genetics can influence our happiness set point. But what about our biochemistry? Consider the systems and pathways in your body that are not only influenced by genetics, but also by what you eat and what you're exposed to in your environment. Tina Hollis will share her journey and discoveries about how to expand positive psychology learnings to include metabolic health with information on how these two areas might synergize to help many find a path to greater positivity. And I'll read you about Tina. Tina Hollis, PhD, was certified in positive psychology through the Whole Being Institute in 2014. She was, I think, the second cohort. She then started her own company called The Positive Edge. For the past eight years, Tina's mission has been to provide interactive, entertaining, and science-based programs that help people have a more positive perspective and positive connections so they can spend more time at their best. Recently, her path has also led her to training to become a patient advocate using the metabolic approach to cancer and health of Nasha Winter, ND. This journey connects the dots from her past life in which she worked in drug discovery for cancer to the connections between positive psychology and metabolic health. Welcome, Tina. Thank you so much for starting our month of June uh, with us. We're just finishing our uh, mental health month focus in May. Uh, so we're really excited to have you here. I'm going to spotlight you and uh, Tina, I'm going to ask you about your connection to the Whole Being Institute first off. Yeah, um, back in my biotech days, I uh, was at a conference for biotech, but in the back of the room, there was some various books that the instructor had brought. And one of them was actually The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. And this was probably 2011. I'm going to talk about this a little bit. And uh, that book set me down this path of positive psychology. And I learned about Tal, I learned about the whole being Institute. And I was just like, okay, this is what I, this is what I want to now focus on. I ended up, I um, left biotech and uh, became certified in positive psychology, started my company and have not looked back. Wow, wonderful. And, you know, Sean was uh, the teaching assistant for Tal and he ran his TA teams for many years at Harvard. And he's such a dynamic speaker like Tal. So what a wonderful introduction. He's just positive contagion uh, embodied. Yes, mm, so yeah. true. Wow, so you have a big transition to talk about. Uh, many of the speakers that come on this program, they're really presenting aspects of what we call the final project or the forever project, that it's their capstone in their SIP program. Can you remember what it was or just a kind of a seed that might have been planted in that year? Gosh, you know, I think it's... Um, I, I think it's that... I remember one of the things that Tal mentioned was um, exercise. And mm -hmm. that was one of the things he was really enthused about at the time and talking about the importance of our, you know, of that physical health and our, and, and that part along with the psychology. And I think mm -hmm. there's always been to me that interesting connection of mm -hmm. our physical health and our positive mm -hmm. attitude. Yeah. 
Yes, in fact, the Spire model, he featured P in the Spire, you know, which was different than some of the other models. He felt so strongly about it. And to have the program at Kripalu, where we started the day with yoga, yo let your yoga dance, you know, all that, really weaving that into uh, the teaching. Well, I see a seed there uh, of your interest. So yeah. let's go, Tina. And I know you have a lot to say. I'm here to support you. And I know their audience, we already have quite a few people are going to be enjoying what you have to say. And also people listening to the recording. So I'll be here to support you. I'll look at what comes in in the chat and I'll come in and out, you know, when I see something that might pop in and you can speak to. Thank you. Yes, feel free to jump in or interrupt me. Um, again, it's, it's, I was saying earlier, this is not at all the normal talk I give. Normally I'm speaking to organizations and teams and I'm all inspirational and telling them how they can be more positive and all of the you know, all of the strategies that I'm sure you've heard many of during these uh, these lunch and learn happy or, you know lunch hours. Um, but today I'm I'm taking a big risk. I'm taking a very different approach on something that has really caught my attention um, just recently. So I've put together some thoughts, some ideas, and I'd really love your feedback, your just thoughts on it too, because. Um, Maybe it's something that's already been figured out and I'm just new to the idea, but this idea that our biochemistry and our, this, you know, our, our cell signaling, our pathways in our body and how much that might impact how easy it is for some of us to be positive or not. And is this something maybe we need to be more aware of and, and maybe talk about a little bit more for those people who could really benefit from understanding the P in the SPIRE model, which I'm going to talk about more too. Um, so please keep that in mind. And um, please, if you have questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat and uh, Phoebe will call them out for me. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit of context about what's gotten me to this point in sort of this journey and how uh, some of my story and how the dots have connected, I think that will make it a little bit more relevant of kind of where my thoughts are at with this. So first to just start on my story, connecting the dots of this question. Um, so it turns out uh, back in 1990 is when I really started off in biotech, all about molecules and cells. I actually went back to graduate school after being out of college for five years and this is in graduate school, I was actually in a lab doing research for about four years, learning about molecular biology and genetics and protein chemistry and enzymology. So really immersing myself in that kind of world. And then after that, I ended up uh, at a company where I was uh, developing a lot of products and services for drug discovery, especially for cancer. So our clients were big pharma, uh, biotech companies. And here I was really looking at more of um, single targets, single protein targets, such as P53. It's a very common drug target for cancer. And we were developing products and assays to help big pharma find that small molecule that might go in and be able to modify the activity of this particular protein and hopefully then impact, you know, uh, cure cancer. And we developed assays for hundreds of these targets, these protein targets, for small molecule drug discovery. So that's just a, a brief glimpse at kind of my science background so you understand a little bit of where I'm coming from on this because then the next part of my story I wanna share is what we were just talking about was 2011 when I discovered positive psychology and suddenly I'm going from molecules and cells to thoughts and emotions. Um, I started my business, The Positive Edge in 2013 as Phoebe said, I was certified from the Whole Being Institute in 2014 in cohort two. And that is where I had the lovely pleasure of meeting Phoebe. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this was, you know, this was like such an aha for me. I'm like, what? There is a science around how we can live <clears throat> a better, more fulfilling, happier life. So to me, that was really cool. I'm like, okay, we're leaving biotech. We're going on a whole new journey. And I really want to share this with other people. I want to help other people realize that this is something within our control. And some of my major messages that I love to give in my talks 
is the fact that we don't experience the world around us. We experience our thoughts, right? But then we think that's the world. I'm like, why don't they teach this in school? Why did I have to be in my 40s, you know, now 50s to really get exposed to this? And so that is now one of my major missions has been to help people realize that our thoughts are so incredibly powerful. And as part of this, one of the things I've done is I've created the path for positivity is what I call it. And this is a five-step path that I teach people to help make positive psychology a little bit more accessible and easier to apply. And, you know, just real quickly, <clears throat> to me, the first step is just understanding why it can be hard to be positive, that whole survival instinct, that negative bias that we have, but realizing, right, step two, that we can change. There's neuroplasticity and we have this power to have influence our thoughts and, and help drive that neuroplasticity in a way that benefits us. And of course, step three then comes into, in order to do that, we need to figure out how we can better notice and manage our thoughts, which I feel like is, you know, that's a lot of where the magic happens, at least in my own life as a parent and spouse and friend. Um, then step four is the fun part, right? Practicing tools to change those simple little things that we can do. And really in our everyday, whether it's three good things, looking for the good, focusing on gratitude. And then step five I talk about is just remembering we have a choice, whether it's a simple password or some anchor, a red light, a opening a door, something in our day that just helps remind us that we have this power to choose. And really, you know, the whole aha to try to help people realize that this is not new, right? All the way back to William James, at, you know, uh, in, in the late 1800s, that the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another, and that positive psychology can help make that easier. So that was my second dot, right? Going from biotech. Now I'm in positive psychology. <clears throat> Boy, I seem to have a little frog suddenly, sorry. But maybe you've seen this graph or something like it before, right? This is, I think the first time I saw this was in The How of Happiness by Sonia Lubomirsky. And I love to put this up and ask people, you know, they've done studies on identical and fraternal twins. And they found that there's three major categories of things that impact people's ability to be positive or more positive. And I love to have people guess what they are. And I'm just going to throw it out there, put it, go ahead and uh, put it in the chat. Do you remember what these three things are? And I'll just have uh, Phoebe read, read anything out to me that you put in. Yes, I will see what they say. Ah, we have some Quick thinkers here, genetics, environments, and decisions. Genetics, attitude, circumstance. Attitude, Lisa says, and uh, thoughts, there we go. So we have that twice, gen genetics, circumstance, and attitude. So the decisions are uh, the thoughts we uh, think and memory. Uh, we also have behavioral uh, interventions, right? The, the choices we make and one person is saying meaning. So really interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, yeah, I, I just remember when I first saw these studies and you guys covered almost all of them here, the idea, you know, when someone would guess genetics, it was, it was, it would happen once in a while, but it was pretty rare because people are focused on the circumstances, right? The, you know, my, my childhood, my environment, my job. So that's the first one people get and they're surprised to see that it's the smallest slice of the pie genetics being a big slice, but then that how we think, what we focus on is a really big factor. And I remember, I'll have to tell you the very first time, I, I think I was actually still being certified and I wanted to give a talk on this. And my yoga instructor said, no problem. I'll let my classes know and you can hold it at the yoga studio. So I bought a used projector. I put a, a sheet up on the wall and I'm given my very first positive psychology talk and I'm like really excited about it. There's me, there's the yoga instructor and there was two of her students, big crowd. 
And I remember putting this slide up and there was a gentleman in the audience who was like, I think you're missing something. What about what we eat and how that affects how we feel? And I was like, what? I mean, I haven't really even run into that idea. So I kind of was, I didn't know how to answer that. And he was pretty determined that this was something I should be considering. I will never forget that. And we'll come back to that. So really, this is an important aspects to understand, but I wonder if there's something here that we're maybe not considering. And that's what I want us to talk about. Because what about what people eat? Like my audience person asked. And what about the people, you know, over the past several years who couldn't seem to gain any ground with my approaches? I mean, I have family members, I have dear friends who I've tried to support and coach with some of the tools. And it just feels like it's not a good fit for them, that there's something more there that they need. And then really there was this story, you know how some things just really impact you. This story uh, was in a book by William Walsh called Nutrient Power. And I'll be introducing you him to him in a little bit, but he is a psychiatrist and he's very into nutritional psychiatry. He had a patient who came to one of his clinics and he is big into running blood tests. He's run uh, blood tests and urine tests on tens of thousands of people and looked at 300,000 or more results and has found some really interesting trends. So this client came to him, this patient, and was very depressed, had actually been getting suicidal. And so they were going to run all these lab tests. But in the meantime, until they could get the results back from the lab, Dr. Walsh said, you know, you should maybe go see another psychiatrist who maybe can help you through these times of, with the suicide thoughts. And this psychiatrist that he went to see put him on antidepressants. And after a day or two of being on them, this patient called his other psychiatrist back and said, I am so much worse. These things are horrible. They're making me feel even more depressed. And this other psychiatrist doubled his dosage. And before they got the lab results back, this guy committed suicide. And when they got the lab results back, Dr. Walsh was like, he should have never been put on antidepressants. His biochemistry shows that he is, that they're gonna make him worse. I'm like, what? There's a lab test for this? How does he even know this? And I'd never, you know, I guess I'd heard that SSRIs, you know, these antidepressants, that some of them don't have good effects on people, but this was news to me. And, and I don't know, I found it really intriguing. So that brings me to the next part of my story, which actually started in about 2017. Now, molecules and cells, thoughts and emotions. Now in this new world for me, I'm finding it's all connected. So how did this start? Well, I'm gonna tell you a little story about why I got into this, why I even started going back and digging into the, the literature and studies on nutrition. And that is because I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. Uh, during that time, I discovered Dr. Nasha Winters um, and her metabolic approach to cancer, to health, that I'm now currently finishing up training with, with her program. Um, and so this is now what kind of brings me full circle and connects all these dots in a very intriguing way to me that um, I want to tell you a little bit about. So let me tell you the story behind this. So back to the whole diabetes thing. I mean, I'm pretty thin. I don't know if you can tell you're just saying, pardon me, I'm a pretty thin person. And I thought I was doing everything right. I mean, I was following all the, the you know, the food pyramids. I had it going as low fat as I can. I even got my whole family to go to 1% milk. I'm doing the low fat cottage cheese. I'm eating whole grains, much to my daughter's uh, resistance. We're eating whole grain, whole wheat bread and whole wheat pasta. And yet, the doctor, you know, uh, 
said, you're pre-diabetic. In fact, let me put this graph up here in case you aren't familiar. So A1C is a blood test that they look for um, kind of an average level of what your blood sugar has been at over the last three months. And in 2012, so we're going back, you know, back to actually when I was first getting into positive psychology, um, a blood test came back and I was like, ooh, you're pre-diabetic. You should really be watching those carbs. Okay. 2013, 2014, they tested it again. So I'm watching my carbs. Seems like it's working. Blood sugar is going down. 2014, I'm below this magic number where now I'm like, oh, they considered you're not even pre-diabetic anymore. So for the next two years, they didn't even test me. But 2017, I'm like, you know, we should probably test that again. It's been a while. 2017 comes and now I'm above this magic number and I am fully diabetic. And my doctor wants to put me on metformin, uh, you know, a diabetic medication. And I'm like, really, I, I'm, I'm in my 40s. I, I don't want to go on medicine for the rest of my life right now. And so I decided that I was going to use my science background to dig into the literature and try to really understand how I could do more. And my doctor was so mad. She's like, you're already doing great. You eat really well. She goes, there's nothing more you're going to be able to do. You need to get on the medicine. And I said, no, I, I really want to try this. I think her being so mad at me was something that made me even more determined. So I'm kind of grateful for that because she was not happy. So now I'm on this mission, right? I want to figure this out. And when I looked at what the CDC and the American Diabetes Association said that diabetics, people who are fully diabetic, what they should eat, this is what they're saying, that you should get half of your calories from carbs. It's about 200-ish grams a day. You should be having non-starchy vegetables, some protein, water, zero calorie drink, and low fat. And I was already doing this and it was not enough. What else can I do? So I want to share with you, as I dug into the scientific literature, some of the things I started discovering that made me go, what? What the heck? I was, it's like my mouth dropped open. I was so surprised and so shocked. And there's probably many of you who are already aware of this, but maybe not all of you are, because this was, this was back in 2017, 2018. Okay, just a couple samples here. Bear with me here. Here was a study from 2017. The title says, a low carbohydrate survey, evidence for sustainable metabolic syndrome reversal. So basically reversing diabetes, reversing other metabolic syndromes where you have bad triglycerides, bad cholesterol. And when they're talking low carbohydrate, they're talking a lot lower than about 200 grams per day. They're talking maybe more like 100 grams per day. Another study that came out in 2011, a low carbohydrate diet review, shifting the paradigm that this diet had the greater improvement on metabolic and lipid profiles than a low fat diet. I'm like, what the heck? I've been focused on low fat for years. And now they're saying that low carb is better for your metabolic and lipid you know, numbers and lab results. How come I'd never heard of this? One more on this. Major types of dietary fat and risk of coronary heart disease. They looked at a pooled analysis of 11 different studies. And they found that replacing saturated fat with carbohydrates, right, with your whole grains and your legumes, that it was associated with a higher risk of heart disease. Excuse me, I've been trying to go low fat. And, you know, so anyway, I was shocked. And honestly, I'm like, I, I know as a scientist, right, be skeptical of studies. But there was a lot of studies on this. And a lot of the, the information that had originally said we should avoid cholesterol, we should avoid saturated fats, those studies were going back and being redone and reanalyzed. And as I was reading the results, I was shocked. So saturated fats, association of dietary circulating and supplement fatty acids with coronary risk. 
that the evidence does not clearly support the current cardiovascular guidelines. This was back in 2014, this whole idea that we should reduce our consumptions of saturated fats. One more, this, this is actually an editorial. This was all the way back in 2004. This guy, Sylvan Weinberg, he was former president of the American College of Cardiology and a very outspoken proponent for going low fat, uh, whole grain. They called it the diet heart hypothesis. And in 2004, in this editorial, he said that this low fat, high carb diet may well have played an unintended role in the current epidemic of obesity, lipid abnormalities, type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Okay, one, one last thing on this. I have to talk about cholesterol because, you know, that was drilled into me, right? You don't want to eat too many eggs. You want to watch your butter, all that cholesterol, the, the various red meats with the lots of marbling in it. Here's from 2000, so 22 years ago, a review of dietary cholesterol and atherosclerosis. Analysis of the available data indicates that for the general population, right, I'm sure there's exceptions, certain people have certain genetic risks, certain disease issues, but that dietary cholesterol makes no significant contribution to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. And then this one from 2003, that people over 70 years of age with total cholesterol levels below 160 have twice the risk of death than those between 160 and 199. And there's been more and more data showing that if your cholesterol is below 160, you actually have a higher risk of mortality overall. They, there's now studies showing that really, you know, there's other factors that are much more important to look at than overall cholesterol, and that this is not a good marker of our risk of heart disease. <sighs> Crazy stuff. And then in 2015, the U.S. government quietly dropped the strict limit on cholesterol, right? And there actually have been a lot of pressure on them to drop this whole idea of recommending low-fat diets. But it's a big ship, right? It takes a long time to turn a big ship. But isn't that amazing? I didn't even know they had dropped their recommendations on what we should limit for cholesterol. Uh oh, Tina, this is Phoebe just uh, uh, just pausing. That's a lot to take in. And I'm really yes. hearing the, um, you know, the scientist part of you discovery going to your strengths to really try to take hold of, you know, what was going on. A couple of people have written in about the FDA being properly and adequately funded and also someone mm. saying so we shouldn't just eat it all. So, you know, there is some concern, just want you to know, as you're framing this, I'm sure you're getting to the next part, but there's lots of activities in terms of this issue around cholesterol and, and lots of uh, connecting. Yeah, and, and there's probably some of you out there who know this stuff inside and out or who have already been down this path or, and maybe there's some of you who are like, gosh, I haven't even heard of this and you're like where I was at. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm, Thank you for your patience as I connect the dots and bring this full circle. But I think that understanding kind of this path I've been on will help you understand where I'm at with the current question of happiness and biochemistry. Thank you, Phoebe. Yeah, and, and I know some, I can just briefly see a few comments coming through that, you know, traditional doctors are experts in what they know. You know, I mean, they're experts in what they're trained in and they're very much trained in a lot of how, you know, to use pharmaceuticals, um, you know, how to prescribe drugs for different conditions, but they're not nutritionists and they're not, they don't have time to keep up on the latest scientific research. In fact, I was reading that on average, it takes 20 to 30 years for the newest discovery in the lab to make its way into mainstream medicine or public policy. So that's a long time before the science and the data, you know, basically catches up to what we're actually hearing in the mainstream medical and media. 
And so here I am in this process. And so I actually, I didn't put this in the talk, but I ran my own experiment on myself because I'm a scientist. I did labs. I changed my diet. I did all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is really true. I totally upped my fat intake, cut my carbs really low, and um, my labs improved overall. And But anyway, I'm during this time, I'm, I'm reading the literature. I'm discovering different experts. And I'm starting to read their books because it's so much easier when you can find people who are really immersed in this and they're summarizing what they're learning in their books, in their podcasts. But who do you follow? Because there's a lot of people out there, which I quickly discovered. And some of them are like, here's the way to do it, right? Here's what you got to eat. Here's what you have to not eat. And some of it agreed and some of it did not agree. And I'm like, okay, how can I sort through all of these experts? And some of my criteria, I went back to my PhD training where we were really, uh, it was drilled into us that science does not prove anything, that a study is just evidence to support a hypothesis, and that the science is always changing, right? Just like Phoebe was talking about early on in our discussion that, you know, Tal is aware that there's new things coming out and we need to be ready to change, be willing to open, keep our minds open to new information. So with that criteria in mind, I started looking at these various experts. How much were they keeping up on the scientific literature? How open were they to change? How biased were they to their own recommendations and experiences? And during this process, that is when I was introduced to Dr. Nasha Winters. I cannot tell you how much I just appreciated her. She has a, first of all, she has a photographic memory, which I learned after getting to know her better. I love watching her interviews and podcasts. She was, um, well, let me tell you. So I, inter I was introduced to her by her book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. And that's, you were like, well, weren't you doing research on nutrition and diabetes? Well, her approach is very much about low carb being an important strategy for some cancers. And so it, it crossed over and led me to her book. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, well, this isn't just about cancer. And as I have talked to her, it's like, no, it should have been called the metabolic approach to health. But now I've had a chance to meet her in person. I've been working closely with her, taking um, training from her um, and her approach that I love from a scientific perspective is she has 10 buckets that she likes to look at. So whether you have cancer, autoimmune, diabetes, or are just wanting to prevent illness, she's like, these are the 10 buckets that she looks at from your family history, from your current lifestyle, from what you eat, from, from you know, your labs. And she looks at genetics, your blood sugar levels, toxins, microbiome immune system, inflammation, circulation, hormones. But notice these last two, stress and biorhythms, mental and emotional well-being. Sounds a lot like positive psychology to me. And so she- me, There's a, a question, sorry, just uh, as yes. for clarity. What do we mean by metabolic? Thank you for asking that. Yes, I, it's funny, I use that word so much now, I forget that that's, you know, it's not a common everyday word, is it? No, so metabolic is the idea that we take in food and we use that food for energy. So metabolic is the conversion of food to energy, but not just in our body, in our cells too. So all the way from our cells taking in you know, food and converting it to energy. So it's this whole metabolic, how our bodies function and converting food to energy. And she's, her and many, many others, researchers and doctors are finding that when we, come, when we pay attention to that process in our body and in our cells, that that is a driving force for a lot of our chronic diseases out there. And from her experience, these buckets are really important aspects to pay attention to, to understand what is out of balance in your metabolic health? What are some systems that maybe need some support that you need to look at and maybe do some work to try to fix and help um, remove some assaults and burdens on those systems? And not only is she, 
she's so amazing in so many ways. She has this amazing, like I said, photographic memory. She's always reading the literature, but she had stage four ovarian cancer when she was 20 years old. Her lifestyle, her upbringing was very toxic. She had lots of health issues and the regular medical industry was, was misdiagnosing her cancer till it was terminal, till it was stage four. Her organs were shutting down. Her body was so incredibly bloated with fluid. Her family was there because it's like, you know, she's got weeks to live. And she was actually on her way to medical school. She was in pre-med at the time. And she was so disappointed in the medical system that it, you know, misdiagnosed her. And she attributes the fact that she's now 50 years old. She, that was 30 years ago, that the reason she probably didn't succumb at that moment is because she couldn't eat or drink anything. Her body was so swollen and so, you know, just all of those systems were shutting down that for 30 some days, she didn't take in any food or water. She probably was not uh, dehydrated because she had so much fluid in her body that was getting reabsorbed. But she figures she probably helped starve her cancer. And through that process, she, she became one of these, she's like, okay, if I'm going to die from this, I'm going to learn everything I can about it. And she'd go to the library and do research and learn and look at the literature and study it. And a month later, she's still alive. Six months later, she's still alive. She's starting to get better. And she's like, what's going on? So she uh, decided to become a naturopath that focused on oncology. She went back to medical school, but not traditional medical school, and has seen tens of thousands of patients. And now she trains other physicians in her approach. And I was in her first cohort of advocates to be trained. So wanted to just give you that background about her. So her mantra is you test you assess, you address, and you don't guess. There's not one right protocol for every disease, every cancer, every diabetes. She goes, you gotta look at the individual person, look at their biochemistry and understand what's going on to know how to best support them. So this is just a website where, um, this is where I take the training from her. It's mtih.org, the Metabolic Train Institute of Health is a new institute that she's taking. So this is now I'm, I'm finishing up training, learning her train approach, the 10 buckets, and then how I can, as an advocate could help patients, cancer patients, people who wanna stay healthy. And I know there's been a couple of questions coming through. This might be a good time to stop. Phoebe, any comments or questions I can address? Yes, well, there's some uh, back and forth around different types of um, food choices among the participants, chicken, fish, you know, all, all kinds of things. Uh, but there is a question here or a comment saying that the outcome you described with Dr. Natasha Winters, is it, uh, that was quite unusual, the results that you're describing. Mm. Yeah, and what is amazing is I think what has convinced me to really pay attention at least to her approach is that, you know, most of the patients, you know, out of the thousands and thousands of patients that she's seen, most of them were, she was their last hope, right? The, they'd been put on hospice, they were told to go home, that traditional medicine could do nothing for them. Um, and in many cases, she was able to extend their prognosis significantly, and in some cases, even control the cancer completely. And her stories, you know, meeting these people, hearing their stories, it's, it's amazing. It's like, how can this happen? And how can we make it happen more often? Well, let's not have people waiting until their bodies are so decimated by the cancer to try to get the kind of support and changes that maybe can help them sooner. Um, Mm -hmm. And and Tina, I, I hear you are, you know, the passion that is fueling your motivation to continue to learn and also to share and to serve. Uh, there's a question here about are the buckets equal? Ah, that is a great question. And I will let me since that's like a whole nother discussion. Let me just suggest I would suggest getting her book and, and checking it out because all these buckets are overlapping. You can imagine that they all influence each other. 
And she, her approach is really like everybody. She has a free online survey. It takes a long time. It's an in-depth survey, but she helps people figure out which buckets maybe tend to be the most influenced based on how you answer this in-depth survey. Okay. So um, I can... And uh, one other question is, uh, what about eating organic foods? I know these are, um, you know, as you said, very contextual, depending on the person, but anything you might say about that? Yeah, I think that for myself, uh, I have some autoimmune issues in addition to the diabetes. And I do think my diabetes is actually more of an autoimmune thing. And through all of the testing I've been going through to kind of learn her approach and use it on myself to really learn it better, I think that I, um, my genetics are very, not very good at detoxing. I have some genetic variations that mess up my detox pathways. And based on other lab tests, I can see that my liver is struggling. I can see some other detox things are struggling. And so I am trying to go more and more organic. I think that some people's systems are probably more robust in that area. And maybe the dirty dozen clean 15 type of approach, if you've heard of that, is, um, is uh, good enough maybe, but I do think trying to eat clean for most of us can be a very helpful thing. Okay, and then I know there's more to go. There's some questions coming in. When can I, where can I take or find the online survey? And then there's some other questions around Parkinson's, dystonia, uh, other chronic diseases, such as, you know, those are two different questions. And I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to share um, a page on my website where I've been incorporating a lot of these resources. So I will, I will get you that. And then I'm thinking I need to make sure that I add my survey link to that. So it's not there right now, but I will try to add it as soon as this is done. So then when you go to there, you can get the, the survey yourself. And it's also in her book too. Okay, and then as we go on, just this last question about other chronic diseases, Parkinson's, dystonia. Yes. And I'm going to touch on that at the very end because, yeah, it is it is amazing. I'm going to mention this metabolic health summit I was at and some of the amazing things that um, that they're finding that this, that it's all connected, right? The, the molecules, the, the cells, the thoughts and emotions. So thank you for yes, and, these and I do I do want to just say one other comment because you talked about the meds that there is the comment here. It's important to mention not to stop your SSRI antidepressants on your own. You know this was uh, absolutely important, and yet we know that yes. there's a you know process to all this. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. This is this is not medical advice. First of all, right? Should be a huge disclaimer. Always consult your doctor. Medications are very important to making sure that you're following your doctor's advice. Um, sometimes it might be that you maybe need additional advice uh, from another doctor, but you know, do not make decisions on your own. Thank you. Um, okay, great, we can move on. Thank you for all these questions. Yes, love that. And I wanna now bring the, the circle back a little bit to, so Dr. Nasha really focuses on this from a cancer perspective right now and overall health, but another, expert that I've run into, and I want to introduce you to, to her and another expert um, in this process of digging into the literature. And this is Dr. Georgia Ede. So she's a Harvard trained board certified psychiatrist, but she looks at psychiatric conditions more from a perspective of nutrition and what people eat. So she says, which changes are worth making and why answering that question is what my work is all about. And I've also started following her from this kind of like mental health perspective um, because she's really, really good at challenging the status quo, but from a very structured scientific perspective that I really appreciate. A couple of her blogs I just pulled out as examples to give you a little taste. Changes to dietary guidelines needed to preserve our sanity. And she is talking about literally our literal sanity here um, and how, what can be done to restore the public's faith in this process of the US dietary guidelines. You know, it's public policy and politics and science don't always mix so well. Another thing she came out with, and I love this, she'll come out with um, comments and editorials on studies. She here, she was talking about a new study finds that saturated fat causes PTSD. 
post-traumatic stress disorder? Or does it? And she says, let's have fun getting to the bottom of this and other anti-fat studies. And it's really interesting, I find from a scientist perspective, like a study comes out making this bold claim about, you know, this causes that or this doesn't cause that. And when you start looking at the very minutiae details of how did they run that study? How strong is the evidence? Where's the bias? You quickly realize that yes, a study in and of itself is kind of meaningless. It needs to be reproduced by other people in other labs. There needs to, the evidence needs to be built. So the other expert I want to introduce you to, this is Dr. William Walsh. I mentioned him briefly towards the beginning. He has a book called Nutrient Power. I find this fascinating. Um, this book is also listed um, on my website, on that webpage that I'll show, share with you a little bit later. But he's, there's something called nutrient-based psychiatry and nutritional medicine. And he looks at biochemical treatments for patients. And he has had really great results. Again, he has studied tens of thousands of people, um, people in prisons, behavior disorders, kids, inner city gangs. He's um, looked at all kinds of different behavior disorders from the ones that you think of, you know, depression, OCD, but also autism. Um, I'm trying to think just a whole schizophrenia. And he finds that there's, if when you look at all of these, there's six main buckets based on his lab results, his blood tests and his urine tests that people tend to fall into. And he says really 95% of people with some kind of mental illness tend to fall in one of these buckets. And those that don't tend to have brain injury from like an accident or sports. He's like, there's copper overload. There's vitamin B6 deficiency. There's zinc deficiency methylfolate imbalances, oxidative stress overload, and amino acid imbalances. And he's like, with a lot of these, we can help support these imbalances and reverse and at least improve these mental illnesses with changes in diet, with supplementation. It's like, seriously? So I find this just, I don't know, fascinating again, right? This whole terrain approach, this whole metabolic approach, so just because of some things that have happened recently, I just want to draw your attention to something I think is just really worth being aware of on this methyl folate imbalances. And that is that he notes that people who are over methylators, they should not be on antidepressants. That over methylators, they have a reduced production of transporters which results in more serotonin in the synapse, which means they have greater synaptic activity. So the, the serotonin accumulates there because there's not transporters around to, to kick the serotonin back out of the synapse. So these synapses are firing and firing. And when you give people SSRIs, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Zoloft, like Prozac, like Lexapro, it further increases serotonin and synaptic activity. And that is a horrible combination. He finds that that is why the FDA finally had to put warning labels on these antidepressants because in some people, it causes hostility, aggressiveness, and impulsivity. And he feels that with blood tests, we can find these people who should not be on SSRIs but it's just not current practice. And it is so sad. Here's a study came out 2020, associations between these SSRIs and violent crime in adolescents, young and older adults. This was a Swedish study. And he says, they find that results suggest the needs for clinical awareness of the risk for severe violence during and possibly after treatment with these. And in his book, he talks about this, that 90% of school shootings that he has studied them are kids on these antidepressants. A horrible, horrible thing. But we need to be aware of this, right? Oh. And uh, there's a, a couple of things, Tina, before I know we only have 10 minutes, but um, when you mentioned blood tests before, there's a question about what blood tests uh, are you referring to? 
Yes, he talks about these in his book for sure. And um, so that's where I would recommend you go to see the blood test. They're, they're cheap, simple blood tests. I mean, these blood tests for an overmethylator, for example, it's like for 80 bucks, you can, you can find the results. Okay. And then probably a lot of those other questions are about really referring them to these uh, books and yeah. references that you'll have on your website. But the other question is, is if you have time, is there a way to share examples of specific foods? Again, I know it's very contextual mm -hmm. uh, and we have about 10 minutes. Yeah. And I would say there again, everybody's different, but I'm going to make some general statements here because I'm just getting ready to wrap it up to hopefully maybe connect the dots full circle here. I, I was just a couple weeks ago at this metabolic health summit in California, and there were professors and doctors and researchers from all of these major prestigious schools just sharing their le latest research and findings. And I just, I'm going to quickly go through just some highlights of things, but there's papers now that I'm getting more exposed to this, right? That are talk about carbs and mental health, high glycemic index foods. That means foods that spike our blood sugar. They put people at a worse risk for depression. Um, they see that generalized anxiety disorders are worse when we have this uh, blood sugar spikes. So carbs affect our mental health. There's studies coming out showing our microbiome in our gut that this gut microbiota Biota is very important that there's this gut brain access and it's impacted, you know, related to mood disorder. In fact, I like this 95% of serotonin receptors are actually found in the lining of our gut. Again, it's all connected. So we need overall body health. We can't do a reductionist approach on this. Antioxidants, they're finding very connected to depression, anxiety, um, depressive disorder, one more I just wanted to mention in this category, omega-3 fatty acids. We hear a lot about those, you know, in our, our oily fish and how these are finding connection in studies to anxiety symptoms, you know, that they help reduce anxiety, um, that they can help reduce depression. Upcoming conference in Chicago coming up here in September. I love this. What you'll learn, root causes and biochemical factors contributing to mental illness, gut and body connection, they talk about how we'll, we'll, we're going to look at um, treatment plans and labs and enhanced treatment with nutritional supplementation. This is, this is a really exciting field. I, I think that you know, we need more awareness about this. But we might say, well, what does this have to do with positive psychology? And here, just at the end, I want to bring the dots together in some format because I remember I used to think there's mental health and there's mental illness, and these are two separate things. And what I've definitely learned is that these are a continuum, right? And as people, we probably float along this continuum, different times in our life, maybe different times of our day. Um, but how, how we're probably very few of us are sitting there and flourishing 100% of the time. And is there some of the stuff that we're learning from the mental illness side that carry over to a lesser degree to people who are somewhere in the middle? And this mind-body connection, thinking again about the whole spire model, right? We think about our mind and the impact on our body, the spiritual, intellectual, relational, emotional aspects of spire, but then the body also having a huge impact on the mind, right? And I really think, at least in the past, I've never considered the biochemistry of people and how this is impacted by genetics, epigenetics, diet, sleep, exercise, environmental toxins, microbiome, there's many things that we need to consider. It's a whole picture deal. This zooming in, like from my, from my days back in drug discovery, like zooming in to one target and looking for one molecule. We've spent billions and billions of dollars and 50 years on this approach with almost zero to show for it. This is not working. We need to look at the whole picture, cells that are signaling with all kinds of various pathways. And then within the pathway of each of those cells, this is just an example of all the different biochemical pathways. So the whole message here is that this is, this is complex. It's interconnected. We need to look at the whole picture. We are an incredibly complex system. And I think that even when it comes to positive psychology, we need to think of our whole system, including our biochemistry. 
So maybe my path for positivity needs a step six. Maybe I need to say, we also need to consider our biochemistry, especially for some of us who are maybe not, it's, it's harder. It's just not, they're not responding as well to the, to the easy stuff. It's harder to shift their thinking. Maybe when it comes to spire, that P, maybe we need to also mention lab tests. Maybe we need to mention biochemistry. So in the last couple of slides, just to highlight, what can we do? I think first of all, is just to be aware, right? Be aware that this, there is this interplay. And if we're interested for those of us, you know, getting info, learning more from credible books, websites, videos, articles, considering what we eat. And to sum it up, if I had to take everything I've been learning, I would say the main things here are, you know, reducing and eliminating sugar, processed foods, getting those refined carbs down or eliminated from our diet. Seed oils like canola oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, those tend to be very inflammatory. Eating more real food, more whole foods that look like they haven't gone through a factory to get in a box or a can. And then really like maybe working with a, a naturopath, a functional medicine doctor to get these in-depth blood tests run to really understand our terrain and what's going on with us. Um, here's the, my website and I will add the link to the terrain survey on there, but the positiveedge.net backslash health. And really with that, just to uh, point out that, you know, when I think about our biochemistry, yeah, I started looking at this from the aspect of diabetes and my own health. But then I ran into Dr. Nasha and realized the connection to cancer. And as I keep digging, it's like, yeah, it's autoimmune disease, it's heart disease, it's also neurodegenerative with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. All of this ties back to that biochemistry. And when things are out of balance, when there's too much burden, when there's genetic issues, when there's toxins, bad diet. But now there was a lot of talk in this Metabolic Health Summit about mental health and how can we as positive psychology um, fans, right? Include this in our conversation and be aware of this. So with that, I would love to stay in touch. Um, PositiveEdge.net slash health. You can uh, sign up there. Just I've got a whole bunch of my, some of my favorite books and resources by category, websites, and would love to just answer any more questions. And thank you so much, Tina. Can you go back to the Spire slide? There was just one request to have another snapshot of, of that. See if I can go the back. right way. Yeah. There was uh, also a question about your slides or perhaps a PDF or some, you know, just a one page handout or something that we might yeah. uh, just so we can find you. But I, I did put your, uh, e your website right there. So here's Spire. And for those of you who are new to this program, it's the whole being model of whole person well-being created by Tal Ben-Shahar, Megan McDonough, Maria Sirwa. Mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of people that uh, work and use whole being um, uh, this model. It's all the aspects, the interconnectedness of spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, emotional. And on the Whole Being Institute website, you can find out more about that. Thank you so much. I'm going to take you off spotlight and then um, answer a couple of questions before um, we end today. Thank you so much for this richness. And you can take yourself off the slides if you will. Let's see if I can find my mouse. It's not uh, okay. Easy. So people are saying this was fascinating and then lots of specific questions. And I'm thinking that, um, you know, perhaps on your website and also the books that you have referenced here, there'll be much more information, Tina, but in yeah. the few minutes that we have, um, you know, there's there big questions as to how do you change the overall medical system? Uh, also to what kinds of things do you eliminate? Do you recommend, you know, that uh, these are very specific kind of things about supplements and, and these kinds of things. So I, I, I don't know if you have any last things that you want to say, but these are the pretty broad um, a range of questions. Yeah, I would really suggest um, getting the metabolic approach to cancer, her Dr. Nasha Winter's book. I think it should have been called the metabolic approach to health. There are certainly aspects that are more cancer specific, but she talks a lot about, you know, the, the 10 buckets and, and what people can do to help support those buckets. Um, and, and on that webpage, I list a lot of other books and articles that I think are great resources and places to start. 
um, it's again, it's a journey, right? It's, it's a process. I feel like I've been on this journey actually for about five years now, and I'm still learning a ton. Well, that is uh, so apparent, Tina, just from when you started, uh, even before you came to SIP and then the journey, and you certainly did connect the dots and instill, I think, a lot of, uh, sparked a lot of inquiry today as to what people might want to follow up with you. Uh, so thank you very much, Tina. That was so comprehensive and so from the heart and so generous. Uh, you put so much information out there for us, and there was a lot of engagement. Uh, next week, we have an elite athlete who's coming in also talking about happiness and how do you actually maintain high performance and not burn out. Uh, also, for some of you, we have Ruth Pierce tonight at six o'clock that's talking about the theme of burnout that Caroline and, and she are uh, exploring this month. So we hope to see you then. You'll be getting the recording from Tina on Friday and some, uh, some other information. She's written us some blogs at the Whole Being Institute. And there's lots of thank yous coming in, Tina, to the chat. So just feeling the love there. Uh, Caroline will be back with you next week. And thank you all so much for such an engaged audience today and wishing you well this week. Thank you, Tina. Thank Bye -bye, you so everybody. much.